Good evening, Huyanan, Moweni. So quiet. Good evening. How are you? It's very, very nice to be here. I have a question for Norma. Why can one not be lovely and controlling? I hope you are both. A powerful intellect, a powerful student, a powerful nurturer and custodian of history. It's an important occasion tonight. And both Norma and Yaku have alluded to an important aspect of its prehistory. There was a false start two years ago when Stellenbosch wanted to honor Simon and didn't consult the family, didn't, uh, weren't aware of the Simon Cordy Collective, which by that stage, as Impo has indicated, had already started the series of, uh, of lectures in honor of Simon, of which I think I gave the second one with, with other lecturers after that. And from that, there was a recovery. And I think that says something important to us all about where we are in our country, that we can recover from false starts, from misunderstandings, from misapprehensions, from misappreciations of each other, even from missteps that are perceived as insufficiently respectful. Norma, so I want to thank you and Mpo and Beverly and the other members, Busisiwe Dei, my former law clerk. I'm sorry that she's not here this evening. She's just started teaching at the University of Pretoria. I want to thank you for your persistence. Yaku, I want to thank you and the center for your persistence on your side. Why is this evening important? It's important because every element of Simon's life remains important in our country today, in this time of awful anguish and stress and violence and sectionalism and anti-diversity uh, oppression. And more importantly than that, because Simon's life is a beacon for the whole of our continent. Simon, as Mpo has already said, came from a township south of Johannesburg. He grew up poor. He grew up in the poorest segment of that township. And he became involved in gay activism. And I mentioned the word gay because the organization that he became affiliated with was a white middle-class gay men's organization in the early 1980s. And he wasn't made to feel welcome there, but he persisted in going there. The second act of Simon's defiance, and it's important to locate his affiliation with LGBTI organization and activism as preceding this, because the two were for Simon coincident. The 4th of September, 1984. The Vold townships erupt into an uprising against the apartheid-imposed councillors. Terrible things happen in those townships, and we mustn't forget that there were terrible things that were done in response to the terrors and subordinations of apartheid. The murder of a town councillor, Mr. Jacob Lamini, was a horrific act. Uh, it resulted in the unjust sentencing a year later of the Sharpeville Six, for whom the legal uh, process had to fight for them to be saved from their death sentences. And Simon, together with other accused, were arraigned on charges of murder and treason in the Delmas treason trial. Simon was accused number 13. He was charged with murder, he was charged with treason, the prosecutor made it clear that they wanted to insist on the death sentence. These were what we now see as the dying days of apartheid, but we didn't know that they would be the dying days. And we could have had an entirely different history in our country if it had not been for people like Simon. Because Simon said, I'm poor, <laughs> I'm black, I'm queer, and I'm oppressed as an African in my own country. And I'm oppressed in all these respects simultaneously. I will not segment one of them off or sectionalize one of them off from all of the others. I demand my liberation as a poor person in South Africa from a township. 
I, it, that is why I engage in the uprising against the local authority structures that, impart, that apartheid imposed. I demand my liberation as a proudly black, black person, and I also demand my liberation as a queer person. It was a momentous stand to take in the early 1980s, and Simon then finds himself in jail in Pretoria, later in Delmas, denied bail with approximately 20 other accused. And what does he do? Does he keep quiet about his queerness? No. He comes out to his fellow accused. What do his fellow accused do, including Mosiwa Lakota, Popo Molefi, Mos Chikani, many other people who gain prominence in democratic South Africa? They reject him. They say, you are a gay man, we fear AIDS, this word that is just getting to us from America and from Uganda. We don't want you to take your part in the dishing up of our food three times a day. We exclude you from our roster. And what did Simon do? Did he cower in a corner? Did he slink off to his side of the cell? No. He arose in angry protest against their decision. He confronted them. He spoke out about his own queerness and about the injustice of how they were treating him. It was a pivotal moment in what became later, nine years later, the world first that South Africa secured when the words sexual orientation were included in our constitution. No other constitution had ever had those two words in it. And we achieved that obviously through legal processes, negotiations, but the pivotal moment was that a young, black, queer man committed to the anti-apartheid struggle on trial for his life, confronted his own fellow trialists and said, I am queer, I will not allow you to reject me. The lessons resonate through our country. Simon and Beverly here organized the first gay pride march in Johannesburg, that wonderful October Saturday morning in 1990, the first gay pride march in, on African soil. When we walked, there was a rain shower that rained upon us as we left uh, the Bramfontein building, Institute of Race Relations building, and then the sun came out and we had a joyful march. He, his life combined lessons for us in South Africa. The one was the lesson of courage. The second was the lesson of integrity and truthfulness about himself. And the third was the reach of his activism. His activism crossed, as Mpo has said, he used the term intersectionality, it crossed the boundaries of our humanity. Simon demanded that all people, men and women, black and white, all people, cross-border migrants, or South African citizens or South African residents, should achieve dignity and equality under our constitution. And Paul has also rightly said that Simon became infected with HIV and to the immense loss of our country, he died on the 1st of December, 1998. He died of AIDS. And he had already spoken at that point about the fact that he was himself living with HIV. At that stage, I had been living in a silent closet of HIV for nearly 10 years. And Simon's death, together with the death three weeks later in a Durban township of Gugudlamini, after she stated her HIV status, impelled me to speak out as well. Simon's life teaches us the lessons of integrity, of truthfulness to the self, of political solidarity, of political agency, of the demand not the request, but the demand for respect and dignity from one's other human beings. But most importantly, it teaches us for the rest of Africa as well, that blackness and gayness are intrinsically connected throughout our continent, that the false, the false lie, the pernicious falsehood that homosexuality is un-African must be put at bay. Perhaps the last lesson of Simon's life that I want to give is the lesson of visibility and voice. Vocality, visibility. By making himself visible in the early 1980s when he was a very young boy in 
Sebo King, by making himself visible in the political landscape, by making himself visible across Africa, he changed the trajectory of our country's history. Simon's example is being followed now in Tanzania, in Kenya, in Uganda, even in Nigeria, where the penalties for LGBTI visibility are horrific. 14 years in jail if you land in Lagos and say, I support equality for gays and lesbians, you are liable to a 14-year sentence under the 2013 Statute of the Nigerian Parliament. For all of these issues, Simon's life speaks out boldly and courageously and with a depth of integrity that we honour here tonight. Thank you very much.